So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, everyone. Welcome to the documentary screening of Kiss the Ground. We are very happy to have you here. And it's also nice to see in the chat. I mean, firstly, we cannot see you, but we see many international participants from all over the world, all continents, and also people who are working for uh, a lot of different uh, public and private organizations. So it's very nice uh, to have you here and to have such a uh, diverse group attending uh, uh, the documentary screening. My name is Marieke. I'm part of the Comeland team, and we are hosting tonight's screening and also the Q&A session. So welcome. As Comeland, we endorse Kiss the Ground because it's about hope. The documentary really shows how man-made decertification can be reversed. It explains that when, the, we, that when we regenerate the world's soils, we can also stabilize the Earth's climate and restore local ecosystems. It reveals that one of the solutions to climate change lies actually below our feet, is the soil. In the film, you'll see many uh, famous actors. So next slide, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Here you see some people from the film. So it's a combination. You see top model Giselle Bündgen, but also Ian Summerhelder and Woody Harrison, and probably you all know him from uh, Cheers. But you will also see Donica Markegaard, John D. Liu, and Kenyon Root Sayers. And they're actually also the, the three uh, crew cast members who will also join our, uh, our Q&A. So Donica actually is a, uh, a power woman. She's a ranger. She knows a lot about regenerative, regenerative agriculture. She will tell more about it in the Q&A. And John De Liu, he's our dear friend. He's also the ambassador of, uh, of Kamaland. He's a famous filmmaker. And uh, you will also see him later in the, in the film. And then Kenyon Root Sayers. She's a Native American. And uh, she's also named Coyote Woman. And it's very nice that she will also share how human relates to nature from an indigenous perspective. So this is a very nice combination of, uh, of people who will all join the, the Q&A later. Uh, the Q&A will be moderated by uh, Willem Verweda. Willem Verweda is our CEO, our founder of, uh, of Commonland. So um, we will jump into that later. Then for now, some practical, uh, practical things. So in a few minutes, we will shift simultaneously to Vimeo. Uh, because there's actually the place where the film will be uh, shown. You will find the link to Vimeo uh, via the chat. During the film, this Zoom will stay open. And the reason is that we really like you to have interaction together. So if you have comments or questions, please uh, use the chat box here in the Zoom to communicate with each other and to exchange uh, uh, um, uh, observations or, or other things and uh, uh, for our Q&A so that these are the questions that we will discuss during the Q&A session we have a Q&A box uh, and that's a place where you can actually ask your question for the Q&A session and uh, you can do that uh, anonymously uh, because not everyone uh, wants to show uh, his or her name if uh, your question is um, uh, uh, will be asked during the Q&A session and everyone is automatically at muted. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think these were all the practicality. So now I'm really enjoying um, seeing so many of you. And I'm also uh, looking for, forward to uh, see the documentary and to exchange views after the documentary. So enjoy the film. And we now go to the, uh, the countdown because it's very nice if you all join the film at the same moment and that you're all also back on, in, the, in Zoom at nine o'clock sharp for the, uh, the Q&A session. So uh, next slides for the countdown, please. So welcome everybody, welcome back. It's uh, lovely to see so many people attending this, uh, this event on Kiss the Ground with our guests. Uh, which I will introduce to you soon. My name is Willem Verweda. I'm a founder and director of Common Land, an organization that is working on large-scale landscape restoration based on holistic business cases. And uh, we have developed a four returns framework delivering inspiration, social capital, natural capital, and financial capital. And we are very happy that we have uh, our guests here. I see Kenyon and... John D. Liu is coming on board, and I hope Danica 
Where do I see you? Donica Markegaard. So please unmute yourself and let me introduce yourself. So Kenyon, welcome here. Um, you are from indigenous background in California and you will soon tell more about yourself. John, colleague of mine, we have been working together for more than 10 years now and you are an American Chinese and well known for your work in the Chinese Les Plateau. And now I'm looking for Danica, but she will join very soon. Maybe John, you start very briefly about um, what you would like to, uh, what to give us here um, as a first message for those people who have just watched Kiss the Ground. And then I will go over to you, Kenyon. Don't worry. Well, I'm, I'm just grateful to be here and I, I'm glad you got to see Kiss the Ground. I'm glad that I got to, to um, communicate there. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions. So I think I've, I, you know, I don't want to take up too much time with that, but I'm John. Okay, thank you, John. Now maybe over to you, uh, Kenyon. Um, many people have seen Kiss the Ground now, and uh, there will be uh, lots of questions also, uh, hopefully coming in the Q&A uh, box, you can see there on your screen right under. Um, but you are looking towards these kind of films with a, a different perspective, because you have an indigenous background, you have much more, uh, you are much more embedded, let's say, in earth and in the soil than many of the viewers. So can you, can you give, can you share with us a little bit about yourself and also what is your perspective when you have seen this video, this, this movie? Mish me to his, Conra Kotkinian, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. And yes, I do communicate with coyotes. I identify as a California indigenous community member. My ancestry is Mutsun Ohlone, Chumash. And I do have some Euromut ancestry as well that I'm learning about. And uh, I come from a matrilineal society. Our, our women, our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunties are the decision makers. As an indigenous person that is very active in the community, I honestly believe that when we take or steps to honor truth in history, the question where we've come to believe the things we believe in currently and question why, that we can lean to indigenous teachings, indigenous pedagogies to strategize sustainable futures. So this film was wonderful in voicing the layers of history. However, it didn't go far back enough. So it's always important that we acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are the first stewards of the land that we occupy. And in the Americas, here in California, a lot of our community members hasn't done its due diligence or hasn't had access to accountable history. Uh, so as an indigenous person, I'm very busy in focusing on honoring truth in history. So I feel really appreciative to be in a circle of conscious community members wanting to hear perspective. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you very much. So this, this film, is helpful for your work, but actually it's just the first step in consciousness. And John, um, since you're still here and, um, and you are working in this field for many, many years, you started in, in the 90s with filming the restoration work of the Chinese government in the Lus Plateau, and you have been roaming around everywhere in many, many, many places. How do you see this film as being a part of a larger, let's say, global restoration community? Is there something missing or would you say this is a kickstart of let's say the regenerative agriculture movement that we all need to do now? Well, I think it's, I think this has been going on for quite some time. And this is, so this, this particular film, I think brings new audiences to learn about regenerative agriculture and hopefully also that it goes larger and that it's we, we need to restore the earth systems so we have the the wonderful thing about what the indigenous people were doing and the reason that california is so important is that this is the place with the highest expression of evolutionary succession on the earth 
with trees which were a hundred or, or the, the highest ones are 115 meters high. So they're thousands of years old. So in order to have this, you had to have generation after generation of people tending this land and caring for this. And, and they recognized the sacredness of, of this landscape and they tended it, they protected it. And what happened when, when this area was colonized by others from, from Europe mainly, but from all over the world ultimately, basically they just saw these big trees as something to cut down and exploit. And the fantastic rivers as something to dam and to, to exploit. And the animals are as something to kill. And of course, after they took this perspective, it massively degraded the landscape. So all over the world, there are people who are recognizing this. We're all waking up to this reality because there's degradation everywhere. And when we know that, it's the first step to restoring because you can restore that nature wants to have a perfect evolutionary successional outcome. So we need to align ourselves with that. Wow, beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you, John. I also see that Danica has joined us. So welcome, Danica. Mark Gartz, I hope I pronounce your name well. And it's lovely to see you here. We just saw you in the, in the movie. And uh, yeah, you are a Californian yeah, a restoration or regenerative ranger. And you have a lot, yeah, a beautiful story. How do you see let's say, the restoration movement uh, evolving? And what is the role, let's say, of, of rotational grazing in this? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here with um, Canyon, who uh, just lives um, you know, a, a few watersheds away. And also John, uh, welcome to California. And so our family, we steward over 10,000 acres of coastal terrace prairie grassland uh, in California. And it's the most biodiverse grassland in all of North America. And what we found um, by working with nature and working with the basic ecosystem processes is that this land has the incredible ability to regenerate and to store massive amounts of carbon. It's sort of like it's just been waiting. It's been waiting for somebody to come along and build a relationship with this land. And so um, in my life, I have done whatever I could to study indigenous practices of land stewardship, um, I was adopted by a Lakota uh, holy man in my youth, and uh, he mentored me, and uh, I've spent a lot of time with uh, my Lakota family, and also um, just reading and spending as much time as possible with those uh, indigenous elders and people who hold that wisdom. and. Um, you know, we, we can show the data, like the soil science behind what's happening on these rangelands through observation and bringing uh, livestock in to graze these grasslands at the appropriate time and then move them along. Um, because as regenerative ranchers, it's all about movement. We uh, move the animals, the animals move the plant, and the plant then moves the soil and draws that carbon down. So we have uh, sort of dedicated our lives to that and to producing nutrient dense foods. But you know, I always tell people I am humbled by what this land provides and I give 100% credit to those indigenous people that stewarded these grasslands before us because they, I, I, the scientists don't really know what the carbon storage potential is. It's just all about bringing those ecosystems back into balance and learning from how these lands were tended and how those relationships 
um, were mutually uh, beneficial in order to produce a future that where our our kids can breathe clean air, and uh, this this we just got through. Um, hopefully, got through the worst of the the fire season, and so it was just at the forefront of everybody's mind. And I really hope that people will learn some some lessons from that crisis we just went through, because really the root of that is the lack of relationship that we have with all of this beautiful life that's right here around us that's supporting us. It's our, our relatives, the grasses and the trees and, yeah. and the waters. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that, that is a clear message you, you, you gave us. Uh, but there are also, also questions. We have questions from the audience and let me, let me share one with you, uh, Donica. Um, you know, uh, people think uh, quite often that rotational grazing should uh, help the whole world. Be, but we know, of course, that this is specifically meant for grasslands, not for forests or other ecosystems, but for grasslands. How do you see, uh, you know, how, how could you convince farmers or how do you see farmers switch, uh, conventional farmers switching to, to rotational grazing or to regenerative grass, grassland management? Uh, what are the problems they need to solve and, and how did you overcome this? You, you work with indigenous knowledge, but many farmers don't have access to indigenous knowledge. How can we help them? Um, well, I think right there that the, you know, many people don't have access to indigenous knowledge. So that right there is sort of a missed opportunity and a broken relationship that, that falls on us to build those relationships and do what we can to support that incredible knowledge that really is holding on by a thread that is being lost um, you know, every time an elder passes. And unfortunately, you know, for instance, uh, my Lakota family in South Dakota are experiencing right now, elders are dying of COVID. And uh, along with that, their knowledge is leaving. So it's, it's sort of like needs to be an emergency <laughs> that we need to bring these indigenous people back onto the land to work with these uh, stewardship practices and uh, and tune into nature. And if you don't have access to that, um, then learn directly from nature. I, it, my kids, they go to nature school and they learn directly from the plants and the trees and you know, they learn how to survive in the wilderness and they learn plant medicine. So um, it's it's yeah. a lifetime of learning. No, I, I, I fully understand it. And we will soon go over to Kenyon because I would love, love to hear your story. But one, one last thing that was just popping up here in this, that is the, the business case for, let's say, regenerative grazing and, and how to uh, make that switch and how to, to make sure that farmers, many farmers are afraid to make this switch. Yeah. Is there any advice you can give to them? Um, what we need is we need the um, consumers to step up and to be willing to pay a premium for the resilience of the planet and the future of their children. And mainly the, 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 the ones that I feel can really turn the tide on this is the uh, larger institutions, hospital, tech companies that have the buying power to say, I'm going to pay a premium for regeneratively raised grass-fed meats. So the and first I'm going to build that relationship. Move. The first movers need to move and then governance, the government yeah. need to, to take it over. Kenyon, yeah. over to you. Uh, Kenyon Coyote Woman, uh, that's your real name, isn't it? If you, if you hear this story and you see what's going on in the world and we know that 2 billion hectares, you know, double the size of China needs to be restored and conserved. And, and we see, uh, you know, that, that the knowledge of indigenous people are, are going away, is, is going to be extinct, you would even say. What is your task in life here? I say I will do whatever I can, whenever I can, wherever I can, for as long as I can, to honor my ancestors to the best of my ability, to honor truth in history, and to be a good ancestor in training. 
That being said, when we lean to indigenous peoples, we don't just say, gimme, 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 gimme. We ask, how can we be good community members? How can we take We are losing you. I'm afraid we're losing you. But, relationship. Uh, Not only to the people, there, you but are. to the animals and all the sacred systems, all the rest of nature. So honestly, teach community members how to be respectful. We would not dam up a river because we know that the fish need to spawn up river. No matter how mad we are at our neighbors, if we're having a fight, if we're upset, we still do not stop the fish from having their full cycle. The same goes for, well, just like when we think about the three, there are four waves of genocide, three historical waves of genocide against California indigenous peoples. We have the mission system that tried to, sec that tried to silence us, uh, indoctrinate religion upon us, force, Catholicize, <laughs> just bring religion upon indigenous peoples, calling us savage and primitive. Savage and primitive is a phrasing that is given to many native peoples. However, how long have indigenous peoples been surviving and thriving for hundreds of thousands of years on the land of their ancestors? And how short is the history of 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1600s, 1700s when the missions came to California, all the way to the 2000s. But think about the petroleum industry is merely 100, 200 years old and the mm -hmm. catastrophic events of poisoning the water, the plastics in the water, carbon emissions and- But all these, things now, all these things are now getting, are unknown. There are policies made, um, governments are moving, even uh, you will have a new president soon, he will move in this direction. And so, so there are people, of course, who are positive about this movement. Finally, some awareness is, and consciousness is, 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 yeah, is increasing, but still, it's going too slow and we all know that and uh but the restoration movement next year we have the un decade for ecosystem restoration uh, this movement is is finally coming up to speed with with, with industries and uh, regenerative agriculture uh, more action hopefully on conservation which is super important how would the indigenous indigenous movement in the whole world how can we tap into your resources and your knowledge we are for instance we are building a bridge right now in australia with the aboriginal people community in western australia uh, and their stories are super super inspiring and important are you doing similar things in california in california we are managing the land with fire however the governing structures still do not understand we need to have a relationship it's not oh who has the best buy-in power, more knowledgeable, we need to attain. It's more of how are we in right relation with each other in the community and truth and history. We need to bring up all of the occurrences of the past to honor truth and history so we can get over it, not sweep it under the rug. So when we're seeing everything, we can then be more accountable to understand, oh, there is hurt, there is acknowledgement, there is coming forward. But if we say, forget about the past, it's over with, let's go towards the future, we won't get anywhere. And so when it comes to being in a global scale, we need to think bioregionally. We need to care about our watersheds first, care about our bioregions first in those areas, because we can't think about the globe without taking care of our own territories and humbling ourselves and grounding ourselves by becoming familiar with the truth of history in the place that we have settled. Thank you so. very much. Thank you. That's lovely to hear. A question to you, um, John, um, from the audience. Um, what you see is that that people are anxious to learn. Students, and you know that, are are, are joining this movement. A lot of uh, entrepreneurial people are stepping on board, but still, people think and feel it is going too slowly. Uh, the whole process. What would you, what would you, your yeah, your advice, your recommendation be? How can we speed up this process? Uh, we have already, you know, all kind of institutional conventions in place, but still. The money is not going to the right direction. And is it all about money? Question mark. Maybe you can share your wisdom on this topic for a moment. Well, yeah, I, I don't think it's all about money, but I think that uh, capital is necessary to in, you know, increase activity. So increase development, but 
development has really kind of been our problem because we developed without knowledge. We developed without wisdom in, in the Western civilizations. The, the indigenous people chose to live in harmony with nature. It's a different psychology, a different cosmology and a different spiritual kind of understanding. And somehow we, we, we change to believe that things are more important than life. And I think we really need to go back to this deep understanding and heartfelt understanding. But I think that one word that was mentioned earlier is community. And I think that that's really where we need to be. So we need to work together, not as only as individuals or as nation states or as corporations or, or, or ethnic groups or something. We need to realize that we are human beings. And so we are actually a species and we need to act now as a species on a planetary scale in order to re rebalance the, the imbalances that we have in earth systems and the imbalances that we have in earth systems are caused by human activity. So we have dammed the rivers, we have cut the trees, we have uh, done agriculture in ways which have no relationship to natural systems. And when we understand that we need to, we need to move in that direction. So, you know, I, it's something that we're both involved in, uh, is the ecosystem restoration camps movement. And I think that this, this is a place where everyone has a chance to practice. So if you're trying to start a big corporation and you're gonna gather tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars and do this, how long does that take? How, how difficult is that? If we wanna make an ecosystem restoration camp, we can go tomorrow and we can restore soils and we can plant trees and we can have a dinner together and we can talk to, to everybody. So this is the way I think that we need to go, that people come together and they, they start to learn. And when they learn, they realize, well, we can do this. This is not that difficult. We can, but, but we have to act as a community. We have to act in the collective interest as opposed to in the individual interests. So <clears throat> I recommend everybody goes to the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation uh, and uh, ecosystemrestorationcamps.org and go join this movement because people now in six continents in 37 camps are already doing this, even in a COVID. Uh, yeah. Lockdown. No, that's an excellent initiative and a good example, but there are more examples and, and things needed. Of course, tax systems should change and should be, be pro-regenerative and, and conservation activities. Uh, and most of the money still is going to what we call the degradation industry, the industry where maximization of return on investment per hectare is still, that is still the, 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 the current system that we all uh, have created over the last, let's say, two or three hundred years. Um, so. The great thing is, of course, that nature is can grow very fast, and we see in many places already examples uh, like like your farm, uh, Donica, where where things are changing rapidly. Uh, within a few years, you can change a, a, a very depleted grass system into a, a, a let's say a, a almost natural grass system where you can feed your livestock. Um, but that, but that, of course, raises other discussions. We will have discussions on, on uh, do we need to eat more meat? That's one of the questions, of course, that, is, uh, that you, you probably have been facing quite often. Are we creating more meat eaters with rotational meat industry? What is your answer on that question, Danica? Uh, I think the, uh, the key is the, the type of food that we're eating. And, you can have the same conversation with a carrot as you can with a hamburger is what is the source of that food and how much death was associated with that food and how much life was associated with that food because you can eat 
even an organic carrot that you buy from Whole Foods, and that can still be uh, causing massive amounts of death. That carrot could be grown in a monoculture where uh, habitat has been destroyed. The deer are not allowed to migrate. The, the natural ecosystem isn't able to function. The microbes in the soil are, are gone. And you could source that same carrot from a no-till agriculture system that uh, allows pollinators to come in, bird life, uh, wildlife to function. And it's the same with a hamburger. You could source that a piece of meat from a feedlot where those animals uh, were treated um, inhumanely and uh, so much pollution and destruction happened as a result of eating that hamburger. Or you could buy a grass-fed hamburger which uh, produced more life with that life that was taken. And you know, we have data to back this up. Our, um, our perennial grasslands are increasing in abundance of native perennial bunch grasses. We have 32% perennial grass cover. We have 137 species of plants. Our soil stores um, on average 3% three, uh, 3 on the uh, shallow carbon and 7% on the deep carbon uh, annually. So that's a massive amounts of carbon that's being stored in, in those soils. Oh, yeah. So it's creating more life. Yeah, no, that's, that's beautiful. So, so it's not about eating or becoming a vegan entirely, but it's, it's about sometimes eating regenerative meat and stop eating Degrad I wouldn't say sometimes, I would say all the time. All the time. Okay. Yeah. All the time. Bo yeah. Boycott big meat. Bo boycott big, big meat. Big. Boycott big carrot. <laughs> you know, you your book, can you show your book, Don, again? Because you have you written a book. It might be good to, to, to people to show it. And if you want to read it, follow it. On uh, you, can, you can see it here. Thank yeah, you. Also, so, a, um, this one's, this oh. one's the young adult, the young adult version for Thank all of us. the... Uh, Thank you. Youth thank climate you. activists out there. Thank you. We will uh, we will look, look into that. And thank you for sharing. I had a problem with the Kiss the Ground film, and to be honest with you, um, because I missed a kind of a holistic landscape approach. So the role of conservation was not there in that film, while it's massively important. Um, the community, uh, the, the community uh, sense of making communities, as John just just pointed out, wasn't there. Yeah, you know, it was a little bit there. So as, as I think, as Kenyon also mentioned, some things were lacking. It was a, one of the first starters or appetize this film. You know, we need more of these, these beautiful films, but the topic is massive. And of course you see in the world and especially in your country, I'm speaking to three Americans, uh, just for the, for the audience to know, we are speaking to three Americans who had just had the elections. And what do we, what do we see in your country? Uh, an, a divide between the urban world and the rural world. And, and you see it in many countries. And I think this is one of the most important topics of, let's say, ecosystem restoration or landscape restorations. We need to bring it to come together, urban and the rural world. Uh, and, and we need, and we can only that, do that by restoring our land and by making sure that, bio, that biodiversity and the products that we create with biodiversity will bring us together. But this is a huge task. And Kenyon, maybe a question to you. I mean, you are an American and you are a First Nation American. Um, and you have been talking about communities. And, and we know that the communities, the indigenous communities in, 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 in the United States, but also in many other countries are heavily discriminated. Can you play a role in bringing the rural and urban community to each other and unite them? I personally have been trying. I call myself a nomadic native because I was raised on the land of my ancestors in Indian Canyon, which is South Bay Area of Central Coastal California. And I drive all over the Bay Area between Monterey and San Francisco. Any given day, I will be driving one to two hour one way commute, um, zigzagging around and voicing well, a lot of people like to tokenize me and October and November, I call it rent your token native month 
because we have November as a uh, Native American Heritage Month because we have Turkey Day where a lot of people are misinformed about the pilgrims and Indians and the lack of information about how that was a genocidal act against indigenous peoples back then. And as a native person, I will travel around and voice how important it is to honor truth and history. I go to third graders and ask them, do you know about recycling and upcycling? And then I explain how every decision indigenous peoples make is considerate about how they impact or take a life to sustain their own and how we are a part of that circle. Therefore, how are we being accountable? So we use as much as we can. We appreciate and we humble ourselves when we have to take a life or when we harvest. When we harvest the decision-making practice in how we engage in that, to not take the first sprouts, to not take the last ones, to ensure that our, our animals and plants, that the ecological biodiversity is respected and given a chance. And I talk to kids in a simple fashion and saying, you know how that rose bush might have three roses, but we have 30 students in the class. If we all wanted to pick flowers for someone we care about, are we really caring about the bees? Are we really caring about the hummingbirds? Are we caring about little bugs? Are we caring about the pollinators? And then how are we thanking that life? Are we recognizing how did we get this food we are benefiting from today on our table? How did it travel far? I recognize that pineapple is not my indigenous food. So who am I supporting with the decision when I want to have pineapples? How much petroleum, how, much, how many people, are people being enslaved? Are indigenous cultures being desecrated? Um, cruelty free, child labor free? Are we considering it? Because it's not about the best opportunity, what's the most frugal, what's the most accountable? And so when it comes to the rural and urban, there is the culture clash. And I, as an indigenous person, have a culture clash within myself. As an indigenous person wanting to live the right way or in the old way, trying to adapt in modern day, and also witness so many things happening really, really fast, and people are not brought up in a culture that's accountable. We are brought up in a Western settler colonial mentality, which is materialistic, disposable society, resource extractive, not just of the earth, but of black and brown bodies. And it's entitled and affluent, and it is negligent of the sacred. It has divorced its sense of responsibility and humility. And I try and encourage people to break that. My own indigenous relatives may even suffer that mentality because of how or where they were brought up. Many of us are in scarcity model and in reaction just trying to survive. We need to take time to honor truth and history. And that means looking at some of the ugly occurrences, but then the layers. Why are these different community members here? What about the indentured servants who are still discriminated against? What about people who were brought here forcefully? What about people seeking refuge? Not everybody is a colonizer. However, they are all settlers and they are all benefiting off of the land of indigenous peoples. Where are the native peoples? How are we being good together? Actually, we need to hear your voice. And I mean, your voice and the voice of indigenous knowledge everywhere in the world. And I just was, I, I remember that when I was living in Colombia, South America, that the indigenous people of the Kogi Indians in the northern part of Colombia, you know, very wise people, they were never conquered, that they actually contributed to the peace process in Colombia. And they were honored by even governments there. So I think we need to hear your voice in the society much more. And I hope, and I'm pretty sure that this decade, the 21st century will help you because there is no planet B. It's as easy as that. And that's why we, 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 in our business model, we start with the return of inspiration. So ROI is not return on investment. It is the return of inspiration. And then we move to the return of social capital communities. And then we talk about the return of natural capital, biodiversity, before we can create sustainable business cases, the return of financial capital. And I think that is that it should be the new business model that we need if we talk about land or ecosystems. Uh, and because land, you know, uh, are, are, is part of, there are a lot of different ecosystems. And that brings me to a question uh, from, the, from the audience about deserts. I think it's your question for you, John. Um, are the old deserts like Kobe, Sahara, and Kalahari the result of human agricultural activities? That's the question. Can you answer that question, John? 
Um, well, I can try. Uh, I can help. I, I think that um, there are natural deserts in certain places, but there are many, many more desertified landscapes. So if you have, if you look at the uh, fossil remains or you look at the soil cores or you look at the literature or the oral history from an area, if they have place names like the land of milk and honey or something like that, rushing rivers, laughing stream, you know, this kind of thing, then there's a very high probability that uh, th this area has been massively degraded by human activity. And this is sort of what I've learned over the last few decades, that you can take any system and you can destroy it very easily because there are natural principles. And these natural principles are based on biodiversity, on biomass and accumulated organic matter. And these principles engender processes, which are photosynthesis, which creates an oxygenated atmosphere. And the growth of the biomass that reaches very high and then where the top of the canopy is, is where the, the solar radiation is diffused. And then below that is a different type of energy system. And then the surface temperature is cooler and the whole microclimate below the canopy is moist. And the biodiversity is continuously increasing in, in diversity. And so when, when we understand that and we look at these systems and then you say, well, what happens if you cut down the trees and the canopy is lost? What happens if you kill all the animals? What happens if you alter this? Well, it pretty much it dries out and you don't have very much um, biological activity. The microbial and fungal communities are measurable and you have nothing, it's gone. So when life is gone, what do you get? Then you get a lifeless place, you know? And I mean, it's not like it's completely lifeless, but you, you find lichens and the extremophytes of, of all kinds, but this is not, this is not an expression of the evolutionary climax. This is an expression of a massively degraded state. So the fact is, if we have this consciousness, if, if we're acting from ignorance and we don't, or from greed, so we want, just want what we want and we're not even thinking about anything else, or we don't know that these systems are cyclical and, and have all these amazing functions, then we just do whatever we want. And then the, 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 the timeline or the, the, the trend line for evolution is like this, always more biodiversity, always more biomass, always more organic material. And the trend line for human civilization is always less biodiversity. So we shouldn't be surprised when, when we follow the trend lines that that happens. So uh -huh. knowledge, consciousness, must inform our actions and if it does and we all work together we always we also need to realize we're not individuals we think we're individuals but actually we're part of a meta organism and we're part of a, a long species our dna contains the a road map of all life since the beginning of time we're related to all living things not just all other human beings thank you john well it, it's okay, I mean, you, you, it yeah, I'm just looking at the time. <laughs> it's so wonderful to hear you speaking uh, just about you know one question about about natural deserts, and you you gave the whole exposure of of, of you know, all your wisdom. So thank you, thank you very much. You know it's it's time. The problem with these sessions is we don't have time enough because this topic is is uh, massive. It's about diversity. It's about resilience. It's about people and culture. Um, all the things that are yeah, as you said, John, part of one organism that we call planet Earth. Um, uh, but the beauty is that we can restore those degraded places uh, with indigenous wisdom, with technology, with the right funding sources uh, and with people. And uh, yeah, I'm extremely optimistic. And I would like to ask you, uh, 
maybe you can uh, have a final uh, closure statement, uh, Kenyon and John and Danica, um, before we end this session, and I will and I'll give over this, the floor to, uh, to my colleague Marika. Maybe Kenyon, what can you share with us? Honor, truth, and history. There are times that things will, we are going to need to learn to honor the past to shape the future. And especially in America, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. However, I just believe that our ancestors are guiding us and let the only thing that you should think about is how are you being a good ancestor? Are you being a good ancestor in training right now? Wow, beautiful. Thank you very much. Donica, what is your wisdom you would like to share with us? Yeah, well, I think because uh, we're coming from such a recent crisis of, of, of fire where, you know, two weeks of um, these mega fires that we experienced was equivalent to essentially all the cars and trucks um, emissions for an entire year driven in California, that um, it's, it's, it's really time for us all to wake up and literally wake up every morning and say, what am I going to do today to be part of the regeneration of this planet and all communities? And find that drive within yourself. And how you can find that is connect directly with the source, connect directly with nature, find a place where you can go and you can sit under a tree where you can touch the soil and you can smell and be in contact with the earth. And from there, you will find that passion inside and you will wake up every morning with that passion and that desire to, to really make a difference for the future. And so we need everyone, every single person on this planet to bridge those relationships. Wow, beautiful, thank you very much. John, some insights, last insights and last words from you. Um, yes, well, um, you know, I think we need to realize that, um, everyone is important and we have prioritized people with money. We have pr prioritized people with power and some of these people with money and power do not have the best interests of the earth or the best interests of, of of life in their mind. And we need to realize that many people who are now considered to be worthless may be extremely important. They may be the leaders. They may be the ones who really can change the world. And we need to, sh to work with them. We need to sh help them, work with them, listen to them, honor them. And when we do that, we get a completely different result. We get a strong community that is able to, to, to restore the earth. And if we don't do that, we get the same vertical hierarchical system that gives power to those people who care more about themselves. But so, we do it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I always um, would like to, to remember that one phrase that a Tamil Nadu Indian farmer said to me when I was talking about his uh, you know, beautiful regenerative agriculture um, acre. And he said, you know, I realize at the moment that restoring the soil is restoring my soul. And with those words, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Marika. Over to you, Marika. Yes, thank you, Willem. And thank you, the rest of the, of the panel. Well, what a, what a lot of inspiring words, and especially um, connect to nature and contact with the earth. Such a lot of beautiful things we've heard um, in the last 45 minutes and also during the film. So uh, we hope you all enjoyed the film and also the, the Q&A. Um, 
uh, later this week you will receive a mailing. You can also uh, uh, find a link to the recorded version. And uh, since there were so many questions and there was so many, so much enthusiasm on our platforms, we also decided to answer the question that uh, were not answered during this session uh, via this mailing. So everyone will get an answer on the, the question that uh, were raised during uh, the questionnaire. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, we'd also give you some, some inspiration, some things um, uh, you can read or you can watch or just engage with even more with the topic. So first of all, um, uh, the Four Returns of Earth platform, that's the community platform of Common Lands. Uh, you'll find a lot of interesting stories of landscape practitioners, of people who work on the landscapes, but you also find interesting webinars, interesting podcasts. So a lot of uh, information about uh, the topics we just discussed and a lot of interaction and uh, opportunities to uh, uh, exchange views with uh, other people who are interested in the, in the topic. Then the documentary Green Gold. Yes, of course, John, John Uh So it's the transformation of the, the Luz Plateau in, uh, in China and uh, it's a very nice, a very recommendable documentary to, uh, to watch. Then the Reindeer Chronicles, Judith Schwartz. It's also a beautiful book. Uh, there are a lot of stories about um, uh, um, uh, the nature. There's also a story about our Spanish landscapes, uh, where the, and she describes what e ecological restoration uh, can mean for all these uh, uh, these countries, these landscapes. And finally, the book that Danica herself was already uh, mentioning. She shares her wisdoms of the wild. So uh, this is also a beautiful, uh, beautiful book. So. Uh, if you need more inspiration, there's a little, there are a lot of interesting things to, uh, to check out. Then the next slide, please. Yes, then um, we also would like to promote our next event. That's the uh, launch of our Spanish documentary, Head, Heart and Hands. And uh, we will launch the documentary on the 1st of December. It's a beautiful story where you see what landscape restoration actually means in, in local communities. So um, it's uh, produced by our uh, Spanish landscape partner, Alvalo, and it really shows the impact of, of, of restoration on, uh, on, on people who actually live on the land. So uh, we all hope to, uh, to see you there. And uh, you also find an overview of all our social media channels where you can stay tuned to our other activities, but uh, it would be really nice to see you back here. Finally, of course, we would like to thank everyone who, uh, uh, who joined. The next slide, please. Uh, who joined the session, but we also would like to thank John, Danica and Kenyon for sharing their stories and uh, also being very, very honest and, uh, um, yeah, and, and, and um, yeah, to share their, uh, their ideas and share their inspiration. And of course, Willem for the excellent moderation. So um, um, thank you for that. And of course, also the event organizers, uh, Juliette and Nadine. They just they recently joined the company, so they 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 started like two or three months ago at Commonland, and uh, in this new world of webinars, I'm very proud of, uh, of their success, and uh, it's, uh, they did a great job. And of course, also Sanna and Floortje, uh, the technical uh, Sanna is sitting here, the technical nitty gritty things, and also the promoting of the event. So thanks uh, thanks a lot. And uh, for everyone who listened and who was here, enjoy the rest of your evening, your day, your week. And uh, it was very nice to have you here and uh, we hope to see you back. Thank you. Mm -hmm.